Thank you everyone for joining us at Assisi University. The topic today is improving the quality and length of life of dogs with degenerative myelopathy. Our presenter today is Dr. Debbie Gross Taraka. Dr. Taraka believes every dog deserves to live the best quality of life for the longest possible time, pain-free, happy, and strong. Her company, Wizard of Paws Physical Rehab for Animals, focuses on that the moment an animal walks in the door, whether they are eight weeks of age or 18 years. Dr. Taraka began her career in human physical therapy and specialized in orthopedics and pain management in both ortho and sports medicine atmospheres. Her knowledge and ability is wonderful to take what she knew from the human side and bring it to animals. She has been enjoying her work with animals for over 22 years and is considered a pioneer in the field of canine physical rehab. She is one of the founders of the University of Tennessee Certificate Program in Canine Rehab through the university and throughout the world. Dr. Taraka has been a well sought out speaker on a variety of subjects. She has uh, healthcare professionals, dog enthusiasts, and owners. She is also the founder and heads the certified canine manual therapy program for the University of Tennessee. Her passions include sports medicine and working dogs, as well as degenerative myelopathy. She focuses on the identification and treatment of pain in all of the dogs she works with. Pain is often overlooked in many physical and behavioral issues and may make the difference between success and failure. She sees a variety of clients in her busy clinic, Wizard of Paws Physical Rehab and Wellness Center, focusing on rehabilitation and wellness. We welcome Dr. Taraka. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, I was telling Carolyn and everyone else, I'm my own in my own rehab. I had a total knee replacement less than two weeks ago, and I'm finding that I'm a really bad patient. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm trying to do everything that I preach to my clients about the multimodal approach and decreasing pain and stay ahead of it and you know, all of that sort of stuff. And I find myself, I do so well. And then I just say, oh my gosh, okay, I just need a break. I just need to lay on the couch and zone out and stuff like that. So um, I'm glad this is my uh, first official back at work sort of thing. And so talking about degenerative myelopathy, it's definitely been a passionate topic of mine for some time. Um, I still remember the first dog that I saw with the journey of myelopathy and dove into the research on it. And of course we know um, from the human field, it's analogous to ALS and it's just, it, it's not a great diagnosis. And um, of late, when we look at breed specific, like the, the Leonberger polyneuropathy and a couple of other um, breed groups that have these polyneuropathies, we can really apply a lot of the same principles. And um, so I'm excited to talk with you about DM. And really when, um, you know, typically a dog with DM comes into the clinic, it is a bleak diagnosis. Um, very often it's the process of elimination. You know, you're just kind of sometimes from general practitioners kind of guessing at what was what is going on you're kind of looking at maybe it's a German Shepherd a Chesapeake or a Corgi and you know kind of trying to th think about you know what could this be you know at the same time this hits things like lumbosacral disease or hip dysplasia you know or a combination of things could hit at the same time and historically clini clinicians don't have a lot to offer you know, and very often right away, it's off the bat talking about um, just euthanasia and end of life sorts of things. And if we look at DM and the definition as a progressive neurodegenerative disease for which there exists a dearth of effective treatments as well as published historical data. And clinicians usually pursue uh, palliative type therapies alone or in combination with physiotherapy. And you could still, you know, just do a Google search on DM and find all of these cures, if you will, or, you know, there's so many things and there's a lot of information out there inclusive of diet change, um, supplemental change, all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, I feel bad owners are often very lost about what to do and what is objective and what is going to happen. And it, 
it's definitely as a practitioner it's not one it's definitely cases that i have to gather up the energy for before i go in for my initial consult you know and the owners they often don't want to accept the diagnosis um, during my initial evaluation we're very frank and we talk about what um, what are the owner's expectations you know what can they handle because there are owners that can handle a lot they can handle having their dog in a cart for a prolonged period of time they can handle um, defecation accidents all of that and then their owners on the flip side that as soon as the dog begins to have an accident they cannot handle that so i always like to start off my initial assessments and treatments with what can you handle like this is the, a realistic road that you may be looking at so what can you deal with and move along with there i also ask and i ask this of actually all of my clients during the initial visit for the owner to establish three to five things that give both the owner and the dog a good quality of life. And that could be anything from running around outside to eating to engaging in family time. And of course, with the owner, just enjoying time with their dog because sometimes these dogs can become exhausting. A lot of neurological cases can be. When we look at the studies, and I'll just hit you with a little bit of um, some of the studies that are out there. Really the, the big study that has been very helpful in designing rehab programs for DM cases has been the Kaufman um, study published in 2006. And this demonstrated that in daily intensive physiotherapy had been a, had a benefit for DM as well, not only prolonging their life, but helping them survive longer or prolonging their life, same thing, <laughs> maintaining ambulation longer and um, helping their owners get along you know, with everything. And so it is when people say, what can I do? Like right off the bat is just getting them on a basic treatment program. And I keep a copy of this study um, in, in my office and we give it to all, all the DM cases that come in. So it's important to look at the, the types of therapy and just the daily therapy. And it's not anything that owners would not do, I always say, if, they're, if their dog was not up in ambulatory. These are all exercises that they would do on a regular basis with a dog without DM. And um, just recently, I have published along with two of my colleagues, um, a retrospective study looking at um, two different types of photobiomodulation or laser protocols combined with rehab therapy as therapeutic interventions for canine DM. And um, so Dr. Miller and I and Louis Tabato from Light Cure um, were involved in this. It was a six year project process <laughs> and we were definitely um, very excited when it was finally published i was laughing that we're still since we're still all in lockdown and covid we're going to have to wait um, but the information is here for um, published online in april 6th and um, i'll go over it a little bit too with you but this is something also that's definitely very helpful in addressing these dogs that come into the clinic um, and one, and since I was just at the start of all of this, I had hmm, probably about 15, 16 years ago had noticed that one of the dogs that I was working with that was referred in from a board certified neurologist with DM started to actually improve and with just fairly intense um, photobiomodulation or laser and therapy. And I said, you know, wait a second here, what's going on? And of course you look at everything else. Is it, um, you know, are we treating any kind of spinal disorders or hip and all of that sort of stuff with the photobiomodulation? And certainly, you know, that could be something that we look at. I mean, you're definitely improving the um, 
the energy into the body, improving the dog's quality of life. But so I started increasing the photobiomodulation guidelines and seeing these differing results, almost an improvement and then more of a plateau rather than that, you know, just kind of that drop and plateau and then another drop. So um, what we looked at with this study was to examine the um, impact of adding photobiomodulation to intensive rehab on patients treated at a single specialty rehab facility. And these clients are clinical records of the dogs. The facility were between 2003 and 2012, and they all met our inclusion and exclusion criteria. And here just, again, won't get all um, crazy with everything because you can certainly read about this but they were referred in by a veterinary neurologist. If suspected of DM, I would send them to a board certified neurologist and um, they would be uh, you know, diagnosed with DM. And um, again, just more of the things, if they had any other diseases, we ruled out any of the corgis in there just because they were smaller and um, you know, came up with these numbers. So what we had done was prescribe twice weekly in-clinic rehab therapy and an at-home exercise therapy. So these owners are definitely committed. They're coming in twice a week for rehab. Their rehab in the clinic included photobiomodulation, hydrotherapy exercise and underwater treadmill and other therapeutic exercises. All of the owners were asked to keep a log of the patient daily activities. And these logs were reviewed weekly with the owners throughout the course of the therapy just to determine what was going on. In clinic and at home exercises were the same for both laser treated groups. So when I initially started, I was using a class 3B laser and then switched over to a class 4 laser. And the big difference was the um, intensity of the class 4 laser. Supportive care recommendations were were made, including the use of assistive devices such as slings um, and harnesses, and then of course, protective booty socks or bandages as needed. And this just, again, if you pull up the article, you can see all of this, but some, and I'll show you some pictures of more of this, but so the laser therapy, which I'll describe a little bit more, range of motion, we always wanted to stretch into hip extension and hip flexion controlled standing um, with a lot of varieties. So all of these varieties of controlled standing were to work on their postural strength as well as their core strength. So we found that core strength was definitely extremely important in um, assisting these dogs just maintain their respiratory health and their ambulatory position. They um, did walking obstacles, so anything like cavaletti poles or any other objects that we would put down mats, anything that they would have to get out of, um, kind of move out of their way. Underwater treadmill. So the water height varied between the level of the greater trochanter and the stifle, and this really depended upon the dog. Um, all dogs started at five minutes um, at typically a walking pace between approximately one and two miles an hour. And as they were able, they progressed. And typically the therapy would increase by 25% each time. And we have some dogs walking for 30 minutes twice a week. So that's a lot for a DM case. During the home exercise program, the owners, we had them work on controlled standing and we would engage this with their, um, their regular activities. So I always joke, I have three dogs, two kids, run a business, help my husband run a business. It's crazy. So when I try to get things done with my own dogs, I center it around feeding time. So I know that my older dog, I'm gonna do exercises with him before he gets fed, and it's always a reminder for me. The controlled leash walking, which I'm a big advocate that every dog should be walked. Um, something as simple as that is so helpful. So we advocated three times a week for up to 15 minutes. 
control touching and massage. So just hands on, and this does a lot for the owner and dog bond, but also to help the um, dogs, the hind limbs to increase proprioception and awareness. We recommended this twice a day. The other thing was walking backwards to help with normal gait pattern, proprioception, and hind end strength. And then when we looked at the analysis of the retrospective collected data, it showed that the combination of the photobiomodulation, the intense group, um, and the exercise had a significant beneficial effect on the clinical progression and survival times. So this and the absence of effective treatment for DM warrants further investigation, but it's promising. So these dogs were living up to 22 months with a good quality of life. And this is again, um, a smaller study, small sample size, but definitely gives me a lot of hope, gives my patients a lot of hope, gives all the dogs out there with DM a lot of hope, you know, to start to look at what we can do for them. So working with the DM dog. And so, as I mentioned, I highly advocate now the dogs come in, I would like them to come in twice a week into the clinic. Not always possible. You know, definitely things get in the way, but once to twice a week is going to help improve their quality of life. I absolutely recommend home a CC loop use, whether it's the CC loop or they purchase a lounge for, and this has made a significant difference as well. You know, just looking at Again, the, um, any pain relief, the increase in blood supply to the thoracolumbar area, treating any other issues going on. We talk about proper diet and nutrition. So without getting crazy and into too many supplements, just making sure these dogs are on a healthy diet, they're not gaining weight, um, that they are as ambulatory as they can be, and um, as happy as they can be, and then setting them up on a home program. And we'll talk more about that. So home function, things that we talk about. And this is uh, actually a DM dog that had surgery as well. So it's a little, little tougher. Um, and things that I always ask for home, are they able to go outside and urinate? And as a practitioner, this alone will often save the life of a dog. So if I can keep that dog going outside independently on their own to urinate and defecate, that will probably save their dog's life. Um, it's just a fact that dogs, you know, owners are going to feel better um, about their dog, about everything that they're doing, letting the dog go outside. Are they able to move around the house? What are their obstacles in the house? So as I'm learning with the total knee replacement, um, uh, area rugs, not so smart. I had them all over my bathroom and I definitely learned my lesson and took a fall. So um, you know, just making sure with the dogs, what are their barriers at home? How much activity is the, the dog involved in? What are they able to do at home and how, you know, these dogs, a lot of times DM dogs become anxious. And are they anxious because they can't get up and move, they can't participate, they can't guard the family, something that they're normally engaged with? Um, so what can we do to help them give them a job? Things like um, the lick -a mats or the, you know, finding food and stuff like that, helping them stay mentally engaged is so helpful. Are they able to eat and drink water standing up? Another big functional activity that we'll look at. Are they able to do that? Because again, that's gonna make life easier for them. I mentioned the barriers at home and then the other dogs in the house. So certainly a dog that starts to lose their hind end and lose their strength, you have a lot of potential issues with that. If um, dogs are fighting for dominance or the dog that is becoming um, down, you know, starting to become aggressive and watching everything like that. So quality of life, I've already mentioned this and I find it so important. So what three to five factors give the dog a good quality of life? 
And I, as I mentioned, I ask every owner to write this down. You know, what makes your dog happy? You know, and what makes you happy? And again, looking at the owner as that important part of the team. So what gives them a good quality of life? I'm working with a dog right now, not a DM case, but an older uh, duck tolling retriever and um, lots of family things going on. The dog is grossly overweight and um, the owner just broke down crying to me a couple of weeks ago. And she said, you know, everything going on, it's been so great that she's, the dog is feeling better, but I feel, you know, my quality of life is just going downhill. I just need her to get to go up a flight of stairs. So I don't have to ask my son to carry her up and all this stuff, creating all this drama in the house. So for two weeks, that's all we focused on is getting this dog to get up a flight of stairs and she, the owner was very cute last week. She sent me this big email in bold letters, news flash, you know, in Bolton, Connecticut, um, the dog walked up two flights of stairs. So she was so happy and that improved her quality of life. And there, you know, this, and everything has been much smoother since. So as I mentioned, developing a plan, looking at, um, I like the dogs again, once to twice a week come in. And the rehab plan is going to consist of photobiomodulation, exercise, and a home exercise program. And can the owner commit to the program? You know, some can, some can't. I always tell rehab clinics, how can you make this easier for the owners? So can you offer drop off and pick up? You know, and maybe this is a dog that you can work with throughout the day. You know, can you, do you have flexible hours? I know right now with the COVID-19 restrictions, um, it's a little bit tougher. Some people have some more free time, others have less free time, but you know, trying to fit everything in, you know, and again, just in talking to them, what are their realistic goals and expectations? So these are not gonna be the dogs that are gonna jump up and run and play again. So having a real heart to heart talk with them. I mentioned photobiomodulation and in our um, study and in our clinic, the plan is to treat from T1 or the first thoracic level down to the lumbosacral region. And we're treating with 14 to 21 joules per centimeter squared. This is a class four laser, um, six to 12 watt power twice a week. I prefer a contact method. I find that it helps greatly to um, reduce the stress. It helps just with that massaging effect, reduce any stress on the dog's body. Um, dogs seem to greatly enjoy it. I will do this however the dog wants to be, if they wanna sit, stand, or lie down. So whatever is most comfortable. Most dogs will wind up sitting and then you know start to, uh, lie down as they get more comfortable. I mentioned the contact method is just it's going to assist with the anxiety, muscle soreness, and relaxation. And as I mentioned, a lot of these dogs are very anxious. So, you know, trying to make them as less anxious as possible. We've been, we have no owners in the clinic right now with uh, the COVID-19 restrictions. So we have a ton of peanut butter lick mats and and it's so funny, the dogs come in almost like kids, like they know that they're going to expect their peanut butter on their lick mat, so, or, you know, or their snuffle mat or something like that. So they're going to get going with it. Mentioning a CC loop, so this is a definite as well. In our pamphlet of information for the DM dogs, it's everything about DM. So now there's a copy of the two studies in there. Um, whether the owners want to use a loop or a lounge. And I recommend that they use this on days that they're not at therapy, um, once to twice a day, just depending upon if the dog is having a good day or a bad day. And not only with um, the ACC um, information, we know how much the loop and the lounge is beneficial, but it's also a big tool in helping the owners help the dogs at home. So I had an owner and just so sweet. She wasn't turning the loop on at home. She completely forgot, missed that step. And finally, after three weeks, I said, no, no, you know, it should be flashing. I thought we went through this. 
And she said, oh no, I just feel like I'm doing so much good at home and, you know, so cute. But, you know, just again, like she was actually doing something to help her dog and that meant the world to her. So um, stretching and range of motion, mention stretching into hip extension. And we can do this passively um, or can do it actively, which I'll show. So we wanna stretch into hip extension. This is the big one um, and shoulder extension as well as hip flexion and shoulder flexion. Very often the dogs are becoming so tight in their hips because they're in a flex position. Their lumbosacral area and their hips are in such a tight position. So really working on um, extending those hips is so important. At home, simple things, four limbs up will help get active motion into those hips. Some dogs are gonna go higher than others, but we'll, we can ask the owners to put, ask the dogs to put their forelimbs up on a step. We can use an unstable surface such as the disc. We can use a chair. Anything that they have available is really great. I encourage people if they're out on a walk to ask the dogs to put their front feet up on a stone or a step or anything that they see out there to incorporate it into their regular activity. So flexibility, as I mentioned, we're gonna stretch the hip, the shoulder flexors. Um, we also wanna stretch the toes. So because the, the hind and toes can start to become contract, we really wanna get them in a weight bearing position. It's another one of our dogs with DM just doing four limbs up. Getting four limbs up will get more weight onto the back leg. We'll also get some more toe flexibility, but we can also stretch the toes manually. Figure eights is great to do with the DM dogs. Not only do we work on balance and proprioception, but we get a lot of motion to the cervical spine, or the cervical spine, as well as the thoracic and lumbar. So dogs may only be able to do two or three of these and fatigue, and that's fine. We're always just going to the point of fatigue. You know, when they start to tire, we're gonna be done. We can do a cookie stretch to the hip. So just bringing a cookie to the hip and asking the dog to come down and hold. Hold for 10, 15 seconds and repeat it three times on each side. Core strength, as I mentioned, so, so crucial. And it's really such a component of a successful program. Working on the core is not only gonna keep them ambulatory for as long as possible, but also going to, again, work with their respiratory health and just keep the dogs going. I have a wonderful client and she's been a client for almost 20 years and we're on her fifth generation, I think, of Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. And her first one, I remember he um, came from, moved with them from Alaska and wasn't officially diagnosed, but definitely had DM. Her second one, her female, which she just adored, um, it was probably the dog that I'd seen go the longest with DM, where just the paralysis started to really affect the forelimbs. And I think what kept that dog going so long was the core strength and everything that the dog had on it. So core strength in all varying types are going to be so important. So as I mentioned, the stronger the core, the longer the dog will be able to walk successfully and with harnesses. So we often recommend the um, help them up harnesses and you know, they're fantastic, but also we want them to be able, the owner again, to be successful in helping with ambulation here. This will help the respiratory cardiac health. It's going to help with balance and appropriate proprioception. And it can be performed however, again, the dog is, whether they're standing, sitting, or lying down. There's actually a lot of core strengthening exercises you can do while a dog is lying down. And we're always going to, to perform it to tolerance. So a dog may fatigue at different levels. And 
we don't want the dog to get overtired. My rule of thumb is that they're allowed to be tired four to six hours after a rehab session or their home exercise program, nothing more than that. If it goes longer than that, then it's been too much for them. So always to tolerance. And it's going to vary. Here are two DM dogs that are in very different levels and um, really working to their you know, own level. And so every dog is gonna kind of follow their own path. And they're, um, both of the dogs are standing four limbs up higher on an unstable surface. And they're working on building up their hind end, working on their core, again, working to their tolerance. The dogs may go for two to three minutes, may go for five minutes. It just depends upon, um, you know, their overall, what they started with and, and um, you know, what we're doing with them. I've had some dogs be diagnosed with DM and owners have said you've turned them into, you know, they're in better shape than they were beforehand, you know, just because we're working on so much core, which, you know, just helps again, prolonging their quality of life. Varying other options here. So just using a variety of unstable surfaces at home, if owners don't wanna invest in equipment, using things like um, uh, pillow, uh, pillows from the couch or, or couch cushions or anything like that are fantastic. Most of my owners want, again, something at home. So I'll usually recommend a disc and a base, like the German Shepherd is standing on and work with different things. Hind end awareness. So we're working on backing up with this dog. So the, there's a yoga mat on the floor and we're just walking backwards. Some dogs just taking a few steps back is the end game. Others, we can get them to place their back legs onto something. Again, it's just going to depend upon their level and you know how they're doing. And this is, again, progressed on a daily basis, or we may say, okay, this is getting too much, so we're going to um, you know, stop at a certain time you know, with that and maybe take the level that they're stepping up on and just work on going backwards. The underwater treadmill. So this is such a key component um, the properties of the water are so beneficial for the dog. You've got the buoyancy, the turbulence, the cohesion. You know, dogs will feel great when they get in the water. Um, the water is warmer, it's not too hot, so we're not overheating these dogs. I mentioned the level of the water can be anywhere between the stifle and the greater trochanter. And um, it really will depend upon the disease where the water height is. So dogs that are having a tougher time, we're going to fill the water up higher and that's going to decrease their body weight. Again, we don't wanna overtire and walking in water or doing anything in water is quite strenuous. Um, you know, again, following that rule of not to be tired four to six hours after a treatment session and just taking, you know, following that rule. So every dog is going to progress individually. We always start the dog with rest. We may walk them for 30 seconds, take a rest for 30 seconds, or just dependent upon their respiratory rate, their heart rate, and how they're handling everything. Of course, their stress. Um, we want to make sure that they're not stressed in this and they're enjoying themselves. Puppies and breed education. So we know certain breeds um, are more disposed to DM. Fortunately, as more and more breed testing is going on, we're seeing less and less of this. But I spent a lot of education on just breeds that are potential at risk for this. So these are Chesapeake Bay Retrievers and um, talking about different um, things to look for if they haven't done their DM testing. Most of the people, uh, the breeders that I'm working with have only bred to um, DM clear dogs. Um, there's a talk on Leon Berger Group, the Leon Berger Club of America asked me to do a talk for Leon Berger U on uh, their Leon Berger polyneuropathy and they were able to isolate the gene and responsible breeders are not breeding 
So that is fantastic. But definitely, you know, lots of education for owners of breeds predisposed. So corgis, we see a lot of them. And corgis do much better than shepherds because they're smaller and they can handle things. But if you read a lot of the literature on DM, if the dog is predisposed, starting treatment sooner than later is actually much better. So getting um, in, and I've had um, dogs that were at risk for DM that we started using photobiomodulation and the SCC loop as soon as the owner found out. So maybe the age of two, way before they even showed symptoms. Um, just making sure, because we know that the demyelinization is starting early on. So can we combat that at all? And, um, you know, we're still standby for more information on that. We're, that's my next research project. Mention the home program. So regular walking, at least three 10 to 15 minute walks a day. And even if the dog is outside and just wandering around. Um, core work to the owner's tolerance. So whatever they could do, and this is a help them up harness um, that we have the dogs fitted in. Doing range of motion, I mentioned the hip extension are, is a huge one. Working on um, toe flexion stretches and of course proper diet. We weigh the dogs every time they come in, so we kind of keep everyone honest, so which is great. Home exercise program, again, this is my clumber spaniel who um, just needs work on his hips. So before he eats, he has to sit on his disc to get his core work done. So while I'm prepping his food, this is what he does. We can also do four limbs up and just like uh, this doodle is doing here. So additional factors, again, I know I've mentioned this a few times, but weight control, diet, this is one of our police dogs um, in one of our local towns, and we're not quite sure of her breeding. So he had actually approached me about DM and wanting to do everything that he could to stay away from it. Um, so we already have her on um, a regular, she comes in once a week for photobiomodulation. She has an ACC loop at home. He's, she's doing core work and is on a good diet. But again, factoring in these, all these other things with the owners, talking about things that, you know, they're not pretty, but can they handle them? You know, can they handle all this stuff? Skin integrity, when the dogs start to become weaker, functional positional changes, their urinary health. I mean, definitely dealing with um, urine UTIs, urinary tract infections are a big deal. And then I'll end with this. This was um, one of the dogs that we worked with for a long time. And I remember this gentleman came in and he was a, is a reverend and he had said, I'm pretty much putting my, the life of my dog in your hands and that of our Lord. And he had said, I really don't think he's gonna live much longer. And so Aslan wound up living another 16 months with a really great quality of life. And he unfortunately wound, wound up dying of um, a cancer. So nothing to do with the DM, but we were just so happy and just so, you know, thrilled with this. And I always say that, you know, these dogs come in and they're definitely difficult, um, you know, emotionally sometimes to, to handle, but when we look at it again, every dog deserves the best quality of life. So with all of these things that we're finding out about DM, we can start offering that to them. So thank you for listening to this.